If there's ever been a good argument for why you should not buy a brand new canoe, the underside of this canoe tells that whole story. Hey, it's Greg here with Outdoors on this cheap, and I thought I'd do a video here just to take a minute to show some love for the oldie but a goodie, the Sports Pal canoe. Uh, I think I bought this in 2004 or 2005, and I bought it brand new. It's probably the last canoe I'll ever buy brand new. I bought it brand new, and the first time I took it on a real canoe trip, I was in the woods for a week, this thing looked like it was 100 years old afterwards. I'll show you the underside. It's beat up pretty bad, because uh, they get beat up. And it's, you know, really the idea of having a brand new canoe and keeping it pristine is a bit ridiculous. Uh, you know, even as much as it makes sense to buy used cars, it makes even more sense to buy used canoes. Um, these things tend to hold their resale value. I, I see them uh, for sale used for more than they cost new sometimes. I don't know what people are thinking. Um, but I think brand new one of these costs in the range of $1,000. This is a 12 footer. Okay, so it's very short. It's very light, it weighs 45 pounds. It's supposed to weigh 45 pounds. It's, you know, I can pick it up with one hand, right? Here, pick it up with one hand, see? So, something like 45 pounds are what these things weigh, I think. So they're very light. Um, they're, you know, really, the, in spirit, they're, they're very true to the tradition of the birch bark canoe. And there's many aspects of how they, these are constructed that is similar to the birch bark canoe. I mean, of course, they're not the same thing, but they're similar in a lot of ways. If you've seen a birch bark canoe to go together and you look at the ribs and the seams, and I mean, this thing has ribs, it's got uh, certain kinds of seams that are not unlike a birch bark canoe. Uh, it, it's almost like they, someone decided to make a, a space age, a birch bark canoe using space age materials, you know, various kinds of caulking instead of um, spruce pitch and aluminum instead of birch bark, you know, and rivets instead of spruce roots to tie it together. Um, you get a really light, really tough canoe. Now, um, one disadvantage of these is that, oh, two actually. Um, let's speak to the obvious thing at first. These seats are obviously homemade. Let me show you them a little bit closer. The seats these seats could come with, I don't even have them anywhere, I threw them away. They're these little foam cushions and they sit on the floor and they move around and you're, you're sitting so, they have your bum about four inches off the floor of the canoe. That's all they do for you. It's very uncomfortable to be in the canoe with the, the seats they come with. Those weird looking little black foam seats, they, they are useless. The first thing you should do when you get one of these is throw those, throw those away and make yourself something uh, reasonably good. So here I've just got uh, two by twos and uh, I made a kind of, i zoom the camera in a bit there. Uh, just using some galvanized steel, bending it, I made a little lip. It just, you know, it goes, um, the metal goes down, over, and underneath again. And it's, it's screwed into the underside of the two by two. With this piece of plywood on top. All right, and then I just painted everything with some um, you know, black sort of stain. Um, you don't want to paint it with paint. You want to use a, a stain or something like that, or, or even a black paint watered down with turpentine or something like that. Because uh, you don't want the paint flaking off. So you want to stain the wood to preserve it, right? These, the, this, is, this canoe stays outdoors all year. It's up, upside down, of course, but these canoes, these seats are uh, as pristine as the day they were made. Um, and all I did was just stain them using some uh, black paint and uh, and turpentine, watered down with turpentine to make a kind of stain. Uh, so, you know, for if you're building seats for your canoe, um, the higher you make the seat, the, more, the less stable the canoe is, of course. But uh, on top of it, these are unbelievably stable canoes. They're, they're made that way. They're made to be stable. Uh, and you give up a certain degree of hydrodynamics for that stability. They're very wide, very fat. Uh, I've even stood up in this thing and casted flies from it. I don't recommend that, but I've done it. Um, <laughs> or I've stood up to uh, get a, a fishing hook out of a tree <laughs> on a bad cast. Um, again, don't recommend that. <laughs> that can end disastrously, disastrously. But just to give you an example of how, how stable these are. They have uh, really good, what you call, uh, what's it called? Um, primary stability. 
uh, not as good secondary stability. Primary stability means its, its ability to stay flat. Secondary stability means when the canoe's half tipped, half on its side, uh, how reluctant it is to, to keep going. <laughs> if you actually get this one going, it's going to keep going, I suppose. Um, it's, it's, not the, it's more of a primary stability type canoe. It doesn't tend to, uh, it's, it's got a degree of secondary stability, but it's not, there's a, there's a kind of paddling where you actually have the canoe half tipped and your, your knee is on the side of the canoe and you can get a really nice J stroke uh, with that sort of paddling. This canoe is not built for that, <laughs> it's just not. Um, it actually came with an outrigger that you could hook on the back to hook up an outboard motor to. These are meant to be workhorses, tough tank-like workhorses for whatever you want it for, fishing, duck hunting, um, you know, going into the backcountry to shoot a moose, <laughs> whatever, right? They're really made for, uh, you know, they, it's called a sports pal because it's made tough. And you can see it's got the ribs, just like you'd see in a, a, a birch bark canoe. They would have ribs like that, right? And it's even got this uh, over the, um, another feature of this that a lot of aluminum don't, canoes don't have. It's aluminum canoe, but it's got this foam underneath the ribs, and that's so that it doesn't make a lot of noise. If you've ever been in a Springbok or a Grumman canoe, which are beautiful canoes to paddle, um, but it's like paddling a drum, they're so loud. And if you were hunting and you wanted to be quiet, or you were you know, somewhere you're not allowed to be, <laughs> I suppose, um, you know, this canoe is a very quiet canoe. It doesn't, see? A Grumman canoe will go boing, you know, or, or a Springbok, they'll make a, it's just uh, really high-end uh, aluminum canoes that paddle really well. Um, but they'll make an incredible amount of noise out on the water. These are dead quiet. And of course you get a little bit of weight with that foam and it doesn't weigh that much. And it gives it uh, flotation. Uh, one thing I don't like about these canoes, and I'm not getting any money from these guys, I just thought, you know, I've had this canoe for a, a, year, a number of years. I really like it, you know, especially when, it's not a great two-man canoe, you know. I, I did a one-week trip with a buddy where we had all our gear and the two of us in this thing, so it'll do it. Um, and you know, there's a certain advantages when you're doing portages to having a light canoe and a tough canoe. And I'll show you the underside and why I like it so much. Um, but it's, yeah, it's, it's not, it's a bit, it's a bit tight to have two guys in. I mean, we were in the woods for a week and all our gear filled up the middle. I barely had a place to put my legs sitting in the back, <laughs> right? We just had the thing loaded. It was loaded and loaded high. Uh, right, but uh, it'll do it, right? But it's it's sort of an ideal um, one-man canoe in my opinion. It's, it's it really, you know, uh, it really comes into its own when you're by yourself, and you can go on some pretty rough water. And if you if you're just kneeling on the floor, um, you know, let's say you're by yourself, you got two life jackets. You put one life jacket on, you kneel on the other life jacket, kneeling on the floor, you can't tip this thing. I mean, you'd have to, you know, be riding a tidal wave to tip this thing. <laughs> Just unbelievably stable. I got a buddy that says it looks like a, a Viking ship. <laughs> it is very similar in terms of it's uh, uh, some, somewhere between a dory and a Viking ship and a canoe. <laughs> right? Very stable. Let me show the underside. If there's ever been a good argument for why you should not buy a brand new canoe, the underside of this canoe tells that whole story. Um, these uh, little uh, keel-like things, the way the canoe came, it had all this rubber stuff around there. And that got ripped off the first time I went over some rocks. I tried repairing it with kitty hair, and the kitty hair can't contend with how much the, the aluminum bends. It ends up just coming off. It won't handle the bit, it just cracks. Um, so instead I opted for using um, roofing tar. Right, you put the roofing tar on, then you let it bake in the sun so it gets really good and hard. Um, if it's not uh, smooth and you're laying it on, you just rub a little bit of turpentine on it, believe it or not. Um, but that's, for me, analogous, again, to go back, look at the way these seams look. Very much like a birch bark canoe, right? Um, and uh, analogous to a birch bark canoe, instead of using, uh, which you could use, you could use um, uh, spruce pitch, I suppose, to mend seams and stuff like that. I thought, well, roofing tire is just sort of like a, a lazy man's version <laughs> of that, right? <laughs> um, but uh, one thing I really like about this canoe is it's got this keel, right? Keel, keel. Now, I mean, it makes it less maneuverable than, and, you know, than really uh, agile canoes. But when you're dragging it over country, right? Uh, in a lot of, um, you know, movies and films where people are in canoes, you see them with the canoe up over their head. Um, a lot of times that's very impractical. 
Um, I find the most practical way to, to move a canoe is to just drag it, right? Um, especially where I live, there's a lot of bushes that are waist high. So, you, you know, you put your backpack on, you, you, put, you carry that to the next point where you're going to put the canoe in, and then you just pull the canoe over those bushes and it literally floats on them. And you can leave a few things in the canoe most, most of the time, like, so, you know, I'll put my backpack on and carry it to the next point, but I'll leave the paddles, life jackets, fishing rods, all that sort of gear just in the canoe and just slide it over these, you know, waist high bushes. It just floats on them. Easy as pie. And it's because it's part of the reason is it's so light as well, right? But it'll tend to hand, handle that no problem. Uh, so that's another advantage of having this kind of keel. It's just handy for things. It's not ideal for, it doesn't glide over rocks the way a plastic canoe will. Um, you know, it's going to handle banging into stuff better than a, uh, fiberglass canoe because it doesn't break it sort of give, it has a bit of give to it right um, this is fairly thin aluminum but still reasonably tough um, but when it hits rocks it grabs the aluminum it doesn't slide it doesn't slide over it the way plastic does so yeah you have to be wary of rocks it does not like rocks I'll give it you know that's a, one of the major things I don't like about it is that it does not like rocks <laughs> but it can handle a lot of abuse as you can see from the bottom of this uh, another thing I hate about this canoe um, is these. So, I mean, these foam things are on here, uh, presumably for, for flotation. If you were in a situation where you're running rapids and, you know, the canoe went over and you get separated from the canoe and the canoe just went downstream to the next pool and you went off to the, you know, let's say you got off to the shore and you went looking for your canoe. Because of these things, you'll find it floating somewhere. If these were not on the canoe, I don't really know how buoyant the, the foam that's underneath here is. I, I think that foam is more sound deadening to keep the canoe quiet. Um, th these are here to, you know, keep the canoe afloat, right? To get that uh, positive buoyancy, because this is a metal canoe, right? <laughs> but a disadvantage of these things is if you're going up a really narrow river, a, a brook sort of thing, right? a really small body of water, uh, these things grab just about every, you know, everything that's on the side of the, uh, the river, branches of trees, you know, any, anything, um, you know, anything pokey that I, you know, like tree branches that porcupines have bitten off and they're pokey, it, it grabs this. You can see this is all torn to pieces, right? I mean, every year when I dig this thing out in the spring, I contemplate taking this off. You know, I've, ne I've never had the canoe flip and lose the canoe or anything. I've never been in that situation. Um, you know, so I strongly consider removing it all the time. I really wish they would make a flotation, you know, something like this on this, a bumper, a floating bumper that is, is slick as opposed to this, which grabs everything it comes into contact with. That's the one thing I do not like about this canoe is this foam on the side. And as far as I can tell, they make the new ones this way too. Um, I suppose you could put some sort of foam in, in the, either in the bow, front and the back, uh, or even for that matter, have a large uh, empty container and just tie that on, I suppose. And that could be your floater. But um, yeah, anyway, I'll leave it on for now. But when it gets so ratty that it's just uh, not really worth having on anymore, I'll just remove it and leave it off and uh, take my chances, I suppose. I'll just give you a little bit more of a, a view of this thing. Here's the you know, that, that kitty hair that I, I tried one year <laughs> to, you know, it's, it's kind of like a, a two-part, uh, you know, auto body filler type deal. Um, it just does not stay on as well as using some sort of, you know, tar that will harden. Roofing tar gets hard after a while. It goes on, it's soft, but it gets hard after a while, after it's been exposed to the UV and the sun and that sort of thing. Right, you can see all the places where I've worked on it and <laughs> repaired it and so on. It's never leaked. Uh, I, the main reason I do these little repairs is just so it remains uh, more uh, you know, aerodynamic, smoother going in the water. And you can see by its design, it's not designed for being slick and smooth and you know, ease of paddling. It's designed to be a tough utility canoe, you know, designed to be treated badly treated rough sort of thing, right? It doesn't have that smooth look of a canoe that's going to glide through the water effortlessly because it doesn't. It's more like a tank. Hey, anyway, the battery died during the filming of that uh, that video, so I don't really know how much of that footage was lost. Hopefully there's enough to, 
to cobble something decent together. But anyway, some love for the old uh, Sports Pal canoe. A great all-around canoe, especially if you're uh, just one person, although in a pinch it'll work for two, guys, two people. Um, so uh, yeah, I guess one final note, storing the canoe. Uh, if you want it to last a long time, don't leave it on the ground, get it up off the ground. It doesn't have to be up that high, just enough for the air to get under it, right? And on a bit of a slant so that the water can't really collect it, or ice or whatever can't really collect in any, in any real way. So this is, you know, I don't know, 10 degree pitch on this sort of thing here. And um, upside down, you know, you could put your paddles underneath or inside or whatever. But if you keep it like this, I mean, this has been outside for, well, ever. It's always been outside. And those wooden seats that were only stained once are in as good a shape as they were when I made them. Um, even though they've been outside and it's very humid out here, it's typically 90 degrees humidity outside, right? So, uh, uh, yeah, as long as there's an airflow, those things don't seem to matter as long as you've, you've stayed in the seats. So, yeah, just that final note, keep it up off the ground. It can be outside, keep it upside down on a bit of a slope so the water can ice and all that sort of stuff can just shed off uh, as the season progresses. So, hope you found that interesting. If you did, please like, share, subscribe, and until next time, enjoy the outdoors on the cheap. Thanks for watching.